What we're talking about today, however, uh, are Antioch's four commitments, and really what does that look like um, in the life of us as believers? Um, and this is fun. We haven't talked about it in a while. And the first thing is just this. All of these are really why we named Antioch Antioch. So if you want to know, um, you know, what's the name Antioch? What's the deal with that? Where did that come from? Well, it's in the New Testament. Uh, it's a church that was founded. So if, if this is a drawing of uh, the Mediterranean and you've got um, Egypt down here, the Nile, uh, and then Israel, the nation of Israel here. Antioch was up in the crossroads uh, from Persia and, and what was east to the rest of the Roman Empire, this direction, and then obviously coming down. So it was a trade city. It was a very cosmopolitan city. It was a very uh, big urban city. If you read a lot of the old accounts, um, they'll talk about... Um, how densely populated it was. It was one of the most densely populated um, city centers in the history of the world. And, and you had these interesting cases coming up where people on a third or fourth story would be cleaning out um, their pots. What's the, what would be the appropriate word for that? Chamber pots, chamber pots. Um, and, and a passerby or below would be, would be struck uh, with the contents, and that this, you know, there's all these really, if you can just picture that being the context of this, this very cosmopolitan city, it got flattened by a whole bunch of earthquakes, um, and so this is a city to which the gospel goes when uh, in Jerusalem you get the persecution against the church, and the disciples kind of begin to go different places, okay, and so if you turn to Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse 19, we kind of pick up the story. So this is really early in the history of the New Testament church. The, the beginning of churches um, is happening. I mean, this is like the the genesis of church. You have this congregation in Jerusalem and, and maybe some pockets elsewhere, but it's very early in the formation of the New Testament church and people are going to Jewish synagogues and saying, hey, the Messiah came. Uh, the Messiah was Jesus and, and now we understand kind of um, from his teachings the next part of the revelation uh, the, the new covenant in his blood. So you, but you got this very interesting thing of Jews going to Jewish synagogues and spreading the gospel. Now, Acts chapter 11, verse 19, it says this. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen, when Stephen was stoned, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. So this, this is a distance um, all the way up there in the north and so it's saying, hey, they've kind of spread out now all the way up as far as Antioch. And they were telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turn to the Lord. It's a fascinating thing. Ethnically, you have uh, a group of people that are going to other people that understand the context. Um, there's this God, Yahweh, and he's had the, uh, his people, the, the Israelites, all this time. And there's all the, there are all these covenants and all these promises, and they've been awaiting the, the king, the, the king that would be in the line of David, the Messiah, the promised one, the anointed one, and they've been awaiting this. And so these Jewish people are going to other Jews and saying, hey, here's the story. Um, our God has now sent that, that long-awaited prophet that we've, we've been looking for to fulfill these covenants and these promises. And so here's the deal, okay? Okay. Um, that's very logical. It's like going and telling your cousins and your, your third cousins and, and your friends from grade school something that they have a, a mental kind of map for. You're filling in a blank. 
But there's something really interesting about these people that go to Antioch is they're now saying, we're going to go tell Greeks that don't really get the covenants, that don't necessarily understand the whole story or what's been expected or what the promises were, we're going to go tell them about um, Jesus, the Messiah, this this the Son of God that's come. We're going to go tell them. And this is actually really strange because um, we typically don't hang out in the same parts of town, Jews and, and non-Jews in that time period, that it wasn't really um, acceptable social behavior to go and to invest that deeply into the relationship with the non-Jews. So it's this fascinating thing that you see, and it sets up our four commitments at Antioch. So the first one is, is simply this, that... Um, That we're Christ-centered. That we're Christ-centered. I don't know if we've got a slide for that. So the first commitment at Antioch is that we're Christ-centered. If we keep reading down here, we see see a couple things. A couple of men went to Antioch and they began to speak to the Greeks also. What was the message they were telling them? They were telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus It was the central part of what they were bringing to them. They weren't bringing them a religious system. They were bringing them news about a Savior. And the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people turned to the Lord. A lot of them came to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you go down, we see something else in verse 26. Uh, As Paul and Barnabas, or Saul and Barnabas, Uh, were there, they were there for a whole year, and they taught all these people in the back half of verse 26, it says this, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch, which is fascinating to me. I'm a lover of history. So what do we still call Christians today? Christians. It's kind of a tautology there, but we, we, we call ourselves Christians. That traces all the way back to the church at Antioch, 2,000 years ago. That's trippy to me. There was someone, there was a first person in the, in the city of Antioch who uttered that for the first time that those people are Christians. Now, what were they called before they were called Christians? Anybody? Followers of the way. Followers of the way. So what do you get from that? Um, what we get here is this 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 phrase out of uh, John, the Gospel of John, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Meaning, I'm the path, I'm the gate, I'm, I'm the one who's gonna connect you with life, with God, with salvation. It's through me. And so Jesus taught his disciples this. And so early on, they were known that that they were Jewish ethnically and, and by religion, but now they were this new variant strain that were also, as Jews, followers of the way, followers of Jesus, who was the way. So that's what they were known before they were called Christians. Now, historians will say that there was something interesting in Antioch, again, their cosmopolitan city, that they had a peculiar way of naming people in Antioch. So every city kind of has, or every geographical area, has their peculiarities, right? Um, if you go to the northeast, they talk funny. That's their peculiar, uh, peculiarity, right? Um, you go to the south, um, you go to California, and <laughs> they've got their peculiarities, right? Uh, evidently, now one of ours is, if you, if you go to the northwest, um, we're, we'll only drink craft beer. It's one of our peculiarities. And I learned recently why that's the Northwest. Do you guys know why there's all these microbreweries in the Northwest? Because w- we deregulated first. In other words, we, we made it to where you could sell beer on the same premises uh, that you were um, manufacturing it or basically brewing it. So where you have a... Um, your facility that you're brewing or, or producing micro um, craft brew, uh, where's Evan? 
What's, what am I trying to say, Evan? Craft, craft brews. Okay. Um, that you could also sell it on premise. So uh, on the premises. So then all of a sudden you, you're making it, you're selling it, but then you got to have food too because that's part of, you know, selling alcohol. And so now all of a sudden you have these brew pubs that are unique to the Northwest, but now they're taking the country. But you go anywhere now and it's like they're cropping up left and right. We started that trend. That was us. I, I actually now, when I travel, like that, that, that's a source of my identity. <laughs> I just take it and, and, and I'm cool. Um, I sat next to some people this summer. I was at a restaurant and I looked over at them and we struck up a conversation and they were from Austin, Texas. I'm like, really? What are you guys doing in Ben? We're on a beercation. <laughs> like, a what? <laughs> We're on a beer cation, and they pulled out their beer cation map, you know, and it was like, like, that's my city. Like, what's going on? I live in the coolest place. Um, every city, every region has its peculiarities. One of the ones of Antioch, historic Antioch, is they would name people. Because they had people from all different parts of the Roman world, and they would categorize them or group them. And they had a way of taking and creating a name for a leader, and if you followed that leader, um, you were named by that leader. So there was actually um, those that would follow the Caesar. Like when I actually was studying this, Caesar was one of them back early on, and Caesarians were the people that were, were the followers of, of Caesar, Julius Caesar. Okay? And there's others, um, uh, you know, other leaders, and if you take the leader and just put the, the kind of tail end on there, that was their way of just naming a subgroup that follows a certain leader. And so those who follow Christ, his Greek name, were Christians. And so they named the Christians in, in early Antioch. And so all this, what does it have to do with being Christ-centered? Here's the deal. Uh, Christianity is 100% Christ-saturated. Um, the, the scriptures tell us that they look forward to Jesus. If you want to draw it like a bow tie, maybe it'll help, help us remember it. Uh, the Old Testament points, why am I so high? Um, the Old Testament points forward to Jesus. Jesus comes and he's the central figure in the New Testament. And the rest of the writings that Jesus said were going to happen. Remember, you have this amazing story. The woman comes and she anoints Jesus. And Jesus says one of the most remarkable things uh, in, in all the scriptures. He's like, hey, when you write about all the things, I want you to always include her. You know, I mean, there, like there was a lot of limited space in, in the, the scrolls and stuff back in those days. They only had a little, little bit of room to write with when they were writing letters or, or books or gospels, whatever it might be. And Jesus is like, two things. One, you're gonna write about this stuff. When you write about this stuff, by the way, always talk about this woman. She's the, she's the coolest. Uh, outside of me, she's the coolest. <laughs> and she's in the story, Right? Um, but it's this fascinating thing. So the Old Testament points forward. Jesus is the central figure. And then the writings that he said were going to come afterward point back to Jesus. And so all of the scriptures, all of our faith, our understanding of how we relate to God and relate to each other has Jesus saturated in that. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. It's not just a way as in a bridge that we cross. I, I accepted Jesus into my heart. I prayed a prayer. Now that's done. What's next? That's not the, the type of way. The type of way that we're talking about here is that he's the thing holding us together. He's our high priest. He's our mediator holding two things together that otherwise wouldn't be able to be glued together. So we don't cross over Jesus and leave him behind. When he says he's the way, he's talking about He's the mediator, he's the high priest, he's the one. And in that, he's also true and he's our source of life. John 15, he says, I'm like the vine and you're the branch. You don't take something from me and then move on and have life. You embed yourself in me and there you have fullness of life. 
I'm the, I'm the living water. I'm the one that's going to continue to nurture and give, give you uh, the resources you need to have the spiritual life and to connect with God that you otherwise wouldn't. And so everything in the New Testament tells us that it's all about Jesus. So when we preach, here's the interesting thing. A sermon shouldn't be, so here's the dictates of the law. This is what God expects for us. Um, we can't really live up to that, uh, and that sucks. Try harder. It, it's this. It's here's what God expects. Here's the law. Here's the way it was designed, and we can't really live up to that. But there's Jesus, and Jesus did live up to that. And Jesus does help us. And Jesus can cover us. And Jesus has grace for us. So that in all things, we stand righteous and we stand empowered because of Christ. And so whatever topic we talk about, if we're talking about your marriage, I can give you three principles for a better marriage. I can tell you three ways to have more contentment at your job. I can, I can give five principles to victorious living. or You know what I'm saying? Like, but if I don't include Christ in that, if those things aren't rooted in Jesus Christ, they're just wisdom nuggets that ultimately you add to the, to the 10,000 other things that you know you should be doing, but you, you really are having a hard time doing my problem isn't that I need three more things that would be good if I did. The problem I've got is that I don't even do the things I know I should do. And that somehow I have to learn how to live into that and to lean on Christ and to find strength and forgiveness and hope and encouragement and joy as I continue to try, uh, to try not out of a sense of duty or obligation, but because I get to grow up into Christ's likeness. Does that make sense? Okay? So in all of our preaching and our teaching, if it's biblical preaching and teaching, it's ultimately, it ultimately has to be Christ-centered preaching and teaching. Acts 1.8, Jesus also said, um, you are to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other uh, utter reaches, that to all people in all places at all times, we are a witness um, of Christ, that what they see in us is going to be a reflection of, of Christ, that what they see in us is going to somehow shape their picture of Christ. So the, the fascinating question as we try to live authentically here at Antioch is, when people look at you, what is it that they learn about Jesus? Do they learn that he's a stern tax, uh, taskmaster? Do they learn that he's distant and cold and, and doesn't really affect day-to-day -day life? Do they learn that, you know, what do, they, what do people learn if they look at your life and what they know about Jesus is going to be formed from that? I think we begin to realize, man, there's something amazing about being a witness of Christ. There's something awesome and weighty about that. And we have to realize that ultimately if we think biblically or if we think Christ-centeredly, we're going to be better witnesses to who Jesus really is or the role that he should play in our life than if somehow we move on and we get stuck in religion, um, a mere set of rules or lists or obligations. The second thing at Antioch is authentic spirituality. Authentic spirituality. Acts 11, remember we saw this fascinating thing, the Jews go to the Greeks and they're saying, look, this message is relevant for you too. It's good news for you. Why? When God made the covenant with Abraham, he said, I'm going to make of you this great nation and you're going to bless all the nations. From you is going to come a blessing for all the nations. And so um, these people are beginning to understand that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is for everyone. And so they cross these barriers and they're saying, you know what, it's messy and, and these people don't necessarily look like us or have the same cultural values as us, and our other friends are thinking we shouldn't be doing that, um, but that's the meaning of this thing. That's where we're supposed to go with it, so they do that, and it creates a bunch of problems. 
creates a bunch of problems. So if you turn to Acts 15, we see what ends up happening. Um, So Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas have gone on their first missionary journey. They come back, and in Acts 15, we see this. Some men had come down from Judea to Antioch, and they were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And so this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. And so Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to inquire the apostles and the elders about this question. So what's basically going on, there's a phrase, Judaizers, uh, legalistic people, but they're basically saying, unless those Gentiles convert ethnically to Judaism and to the law, go through all the rites and the rituals to basically become um, converted Jews, then they can take hold of this promise of the Messiah and get saved. So there's this prior step necessary that they have to undergo, and then they can go uh, and get the secondary thing, which is this salvation. And Paul and Barnabas, Paul wrote the whole book of Galatians on this topic. And Paul's basically like, if the law really still matters, then what did, what did Christ really come to do? What did he die on the cross to do if it was a substitutionary atonement, that he was, in some sense, atoning for our sins? Why then still the law? Why then Moses' law, if it wasn't good enough before Jesus, why do we still include that, right? So the whole book of Galatians is written on this. And if you picture what's going on in Antioch, is people are coming and saying, you can't have fellowship meals with those people, unless they become like you in terms of uh, becoming Jews. What would it be like if in this church um, we're building these friendships, these gospel friendships, and you're different than I am, maybe a different race, a different color, a different whatever, and somebody comes in and begins saying, there, there has to be these ceremonial things that take place before you can then be in relationship. And it's, a, it's this fascinating um, tension that arises. Paul and Barnabas go down and the Jerusalem Council happens, what's known as the Jerusalem Council. And in some sense, they're vindicated that, no, this is for the Gentiles. They don't have to become Jews first. The gospel is for all different people. Okay? What does that have to do with authentic spirituality? we can so easily reduce down this relationship that Jesus offers us, salvation he offers us, we can reduce that down to a set of rules or behaviors so quickly and begin to make it human-centered rather than Christ-centered. We can do it in our churches without even realizing it. There's a whole thing going on in the 80s called the worship wars. Anyone remember the worship wars? Church is being split apart because drums were being introduced into the music sets of churches. And you know, drums, maybe you don't know. Uh, if you're from the South, you know. Drums are evil. That's, I mean, that's where I experienced worship wars. Um, so maybe there's other people other than just the South that think. Anyways, so the worship wars were about style. Okay, so Christianity is only Christianity if it's this style, uh, hymns, or liturgy, or contemporary music, or if it's packaged this way, the way I like it, the way I prefer it, the way I want it, the way it's always been in my tradition, okay, if it's done that way, and if you'll submit to that and come around those sets of rules, then we can be in fellowship. And if, and if not, we're going to break fellowship over it. And so what happened with Antioch, the, the, the church at Antioch early on was simply this. Um, grace trumped the law and relationship trun trumped religion or ritual or religiosity. Okay, are you following me? Grace trumped the law. Grace came to the forefront and it wasn't going to be about the law and, and let's judge each other and scrutinize each other and categorize each other and tear each other apart to figure out who's going to be the rightest or the bestest and then those people are going to be at the center. 
and that's where we're going to find unity, that it wasn't about that, and it wasn't about religion either. How are we going to get it right? How are we going to do it um, the right way? It was about relationship. And so grace trumps law, and relationship trumps religion or religiosity. And we all kind of know that if we're living authentically into our faith, um, there's something remarkable about that. There's something radically different than when we're kind of rule-bound or we're analyzing and scrutinizing each other. So we see this at the early church at Antioch, authentic spirituality, that they valued the people for who they were um, and didn't judge them for who they weren't or try to make them fit into rules. Uh, The third thing is intentional community. Intentional community. Um, Acts 11, they intentionalized sharing the faith across the boundaries of of race or ethnicity. It, It wasn't something that happened accidentally. It was something they intentionalized. And there's something that I think is going on in my generation, given kind of our cultural values, that we don't intentionalize spiritual relationships. We're so relationship saturated. We're, we're relationship saturated that we've got a, a subgroup for everything and we don't need relationship anymore. It's not, it's not a felt need. We don't even have the time or energy for it. They say that everybody's like a Lego block. That you've got six pegs for, for really good relationships. But or, or maybe you have more, um, depending on uh, your station of life or, or where you're at age-wise or discretionary time-wise. But you've only got so many slots in your life for meaningful relationships, right? And what happens is, is um, what they'll say kind of uh, sociologists when they're talking about it is, when you get to a certain point and you've got all the deep relationships you can handle, you have to take some some off before you can add others. It's pretty logical, right? Does that make sense? Most people come into a church community, most people or a lot of people, already relationship full. Already relationship full. Then some people come in very relationship needy or they've moved to the area and they don't have relationship. And so how does that really turn into a deep rich spiritual community where we're sharing everything, having everything in common, and there's this wonderful fellowship of believers that the New Testament envisions. How does that really happen? I mean, it's a real challenge, isn't it? And if you're relationship full and you're not coming looking for relationship in a church and and you show up on Sundays because you have the value of congregating together or worshiping together, what begins to happen if you're not getting invested uh, into other people's lives or other people building relationships with you. You don't have any relationship. Uh, You're kind of, you're kind of back a couple layers. And what do we do when we're back a couple layers? At a sports game or at a movie or at a play, anything where we're removed a couple layers from the playing field, what do we do naturally? Evaluate. And critique. Uh, what happens on a Sunday morning can be evaluated or critiqued all day long. Anyone can. Each week's a different one, but there's something that's going on that you can imba- uh, imagine it happening different or compare it against last week or compare it against a different experience. And so if all we're doing is coming on Sunday mornings as spectators, but there's no relational kind of connectivity, then we're going to slowly take on the, the vibe of a spectator, which means we're going to evaluate everything. Everything is going to pass in front of our, our purview, and our mind is going to naturally try and assess it. It's, it's a radically different posture than being invested in community where we're coming and we're finding the relationships or sitting next to the people or asking how things are going or whatever it might be, greeting other people as they're walking in, because then all of a sudden it becomes about my family, my community, who I need to follow up with, who I need to talk to, 
how did, how did that thing turn out this week when you went into the doctor? I saw on Facebook that you have a really difficult time, that this happened. Can you tell me more about it? I'd love to pray for you. And then all of a sudden it becomes totally different in terms of a participatory thing. And that's one of the things I'm looking at and saying, man, if the church is going to survive in, in, in this generation, we have to find ways not to get rid of certain aspects. The, the disciples always taught from, from the, the stair steps. You know the first mega church? I mean, a mega church is thousands, right? You know the first mega church in the history of, of the New Testament era, where it was? The first mega church was the first church. It was the church in Jerusalem. Thousands came to the Lord on the first day, literally. And then more and more were added all the time. And then they would all go and gather and, and see themselves as a, a Jerusalem congregation and listen to teaching. And those same leaders of that Jerusalem church then appointed deacons to go handle the difficulties or the challenges of a very, very large congregation of people that had needs. There was Jewish-speaking widows and Greek-speaking widows, and the disbursement of funds for those widows wasn't necessarily happening fairly. And so there was a whole leadership structure that, that, that then went into it. But what was the first megachurch? It was the Jerusalem church. So size isn't a problem. Um, institution isn't a problem. I've grown up as a church planter in conversations for now 15 years about the right model of church. And you get this whole institution versus anti-institution. And, and that that's, it doesn't make sense. Here's why. Um, I'm against the institutional church. You know that you've got leaders and policies and, and tithes and offerings and, and whatever it might be, structure. I'm against that. I want, I want just pure Holy Spirit stuff. So I'm going to start an, a, a non-institutional church in my home. We're going to have a home church. It's not going to be institutional. Okay. So let's play that out. So you've got a home church. You've got 10 people, 15 people. What happens if it begins to grow? And you don't fit in a home anymore. Maybe you're in San Francisco and homes are small or something. So, so oh, okay, we don't fit in this house. Well, um, let's look for somewhere to meet where we do fit. I know, I know some, some place that doesn't uh, open on Sunday mornings. Let's go meet there. Well, shoot, um, they're not going to charge us rent, but we've got to pay for wear and tear. Okay, well, so then we've got to sign a contract for wear and tear on the facilities, even though we're not, you know, we don't own a space, we're not renting a space because we're anti-institutional. Well, whose name is, who's going to sign for the wear and tear on this contract with this space? Well, or say you stay in a home because you've got somebody who's got a really big home, and you've got a couple kids, and they're here, and you've got a really big home, and all of a sudden a guy comes into your congregation and he's a registered sex offender. Okay, um, Jesus loves everybody, uh, but we gotta we gotta have some policies. We got we gotta we gotta because we're responsible now somehow to for this whole thing for this person who is loved by Jesus, but then also for families. And, and there's a certain thing here that says we have to figure out how this works together. So we got to create policies. But, but all of a sudden now we're slowly becoming institutional, right? Institution isn't bad. Marriage is an institution. It's an institution, the institution of marriage. Um, there's covenants and vows that take place. Uh, church is an institution. Institution is not a bad word. Um, it's almost an unnecessary thing as a group of people organize and find themselves in a healthy community. What, what should be the question is simply this. Regardless of the size of the church, whether 20 or 2,000, is it a church where the Holy Spirit is able to steer and to lead in the way that, that God would have that church go? Is our lives being changed? Is the teaching and the doctrine about Christ in this, this gospel that we have, the grace that we have in Jesus, or is it just kind of degenerating down into man-made religion or something else like that? It's not about the size and it's not about policies or, um, or leadership structures or institutionality. 
Uh, it's, it's really about the health of the community, which really only happens if we intentionalize it. We all as Christians bear this responsibility to intentionalize spiritual fellowship. Over and over and over again, all throughout the New Testament, it talks about the believers getting together and praying for each other. And the writer of the, in, in the book of Hebrews was talking to a group of people that were not meeting together anymore because there's all this baggage and persecution coming with, with congregating. And so they, they kind of gave up on it and stopped meeting like is happening today in America. There's all this baggage. You know, church is hypocritical. And hey, I had a bad experience one place. And hey, I don't need it anyways. I got some Christian friends. Let me just do my religion my own way. And so the writer um, in the book of Hebrews says, listen, don't do it. Don't stop meeting together. Don't forsake meeting together with the other believers. There's something about um, coming together as a body of believers and worshiping together that is good and right and true. It's the family. It's what God designs. So there's a study I heard this week of, um, I think it was 3,000 church congregations. And they, they had all these different things and some really smart guys that do this kind of thing. And so they analyzed uh, all this data a whole bunch of different ways. And one of the things they found out was this. If somebody is serving at a, at a local church and in a small group. So um, serving on a Sunday morning and then there's a touch point during the week, some other place, okay? They were five times more likely to talk about their faith uh, with people in the community, non-Christians in the community. And you could say, well, the, the spiritually mature people we're the ones that were serving. That's why the data said, you know, five times more talking about their grace story or their faith story about how um, Jesus had changed their life. Five times more likely. I think it's the other way around that when we intentionalize community, we're living up into the way we're supposed to live and everything else turns on that. People are encouraging us during the week. We're seeing the value of our church. We actually own our church, a piece of it, so we get excited about it. And then during the week, we're telling someone, hey, you ought to come to my church. Why? Because I like it. Why do I like it? Because I'm a, I'm a part owner in it. It's my church. I see the good things in it because I see the faces every week, and I talk to those people. But it's something um, that's been haunting me for months and months and months and months and months. Um, and so Tamara and I, at the beginning of the summer, decided to start a small group. Um, we wanted to start an inter intergenerational small group that had college age all the way up through um, grandparents and that we would have that. And the reason we wanted to do that was real simple. Uh, we began to really realize we needed people that could pray for us. Um, you know, the difficulties we're going through or, or have gone through in life, the basic challenges, that you look around and you're like, nobody's tracking with this story that, that's unfolding in our life. No one's tracking with this challenge that, that isn't going to resolve anytime soon. And, and we can't just all of a sudden go ask for prayer from someone that just doesn't even understand it. It's just going to feel cheap or hollow or weird. So where are those people on a regular basis in our life that know what's going on in our life that can surround us in prayer? Um, where are the, the other people that are really miserable so that when we're feeling miserable, we don't feel so bad? <laughs> and if we get enough different ages in this small group, we'll cover the bases, you know? Like, we've got all sorts of different kind of miserable people in there, you know? Um, but there's something serious about that. Where are the people that we're intentionalizing spiritual community with where prayer is a part of that, where Christ is a part of that? And I've got a lot of friends that are like, man, I got all sorts of Christian fellowship. I don't need like a small group or I don't need to intentionalize that kind of community. And I'm like, I got a lot of Christian friends too. I probably have more than you do. They don't pray for me. And I don't know that I pray for them. And half the time when I see them, um, I don't have time for them. And so I'm squirming, you know, like, because I'm late to somewhere or one of my kids 
is waiting on me and they're not going to understand why daddy was late. All they're going to think of is uh, daddy always chooses work over me. So I'm living with that, right, in my mind. That's what my kid's going to think. But here's a Christian friend. And it's not like we're even talking about spiritual stuff, but they're just, they're, I, I don't have time. Okay, so let me do this subtle body language. Okay, that's not working. Let me do the strong body language. Okay, ah, that's really not working either. This is awkward. Let me do the super awkward body language that I got to leave. Okay, that worked. And now they think I suck. And so I'm driving home to a kid who thinks I'm late because I always choose work over them. And I'm like, and that person's leaving the church because they think I'm a bad pastor and that I don't love people. And God, why, did, why was I even born? Because I cannot win. <laughs> I can't win. God. Um, and in all that, right, I need, a, I need a small group. I need some people that understand my challenges. I need to understand some other people's challenges so that it puts my challenges in perspective. My challenges aren't the only challenges in the world, right? Um, so I also, uh, with a couple guys, started a Thursday morning um, guys breakfast group. So we meet and we go through the Proverbs. We call it the Senators Club, which I think is kind of a cool name. Because senators, um, going all the way back to the Roman times, meant wise old men. That's what senators mean. As invented before Amer the American Senate. Um, <laughs> all the way back, Senate. Um, but I'm like, I, so these guys, we meet and we take a chapter of Proverbs every week. And we just talk through it and banter it back and forth. And... We're hoping that maybe we'll become wise one day or wiser. But we have to intentionalize spiritual community. This whole thing of like, I've got Christian friends, it just doesn't, it's not really it. It's not. Um, and so I'm excited about what can happen this fall at Antioch as we keep trying to intentionalize interacting with each other and making the sacrifices that are going to make that happen. Uh, last thing here, and we'll touch on this just briefly, is missional. Difference between the word missional and missions. Missions implied that there was missionaries, and where do they go? They go to the Philippines, or they go to Africa, and they're, they're the super Christians, and every church has their missionaries, and then what do the rest of us do? Um, have church softball leagues. I, you know, I don't know. What, what, what do the rest of us do? Um, well, the, the rest of us are supposed to be witnesses, and we're supposed to glorify God in all that we, we do at work, in our playtime, with our families, as we're driving around in Bend, Oregon. We're supposed to glorify God in all we do. We have this incredible opportunity. There is no secular sacred distinction where sacred means super Christians that are like um, the priests, and, and then uh, Secular, that word just means common. You know, and then there's the common people, you know, the, the blacksmith, you know, or the whatever. And in the, in the Reformation, they got rid of that and they said, no, there's the priesthood of believers out of First Peter that we're all, we're all called to be able to give glory. We're all called to minister. We all can have a missional mindset. You know, if you're a Christian, you're a missionary. You are called and sent to your place. Right where you're at, that place is the most important place in the world for you. That's your place. That's where God has called you. Now, overseas can matter. Different parts of the country can matter. But if you're living in this place, it also has to matter. Does that make sense? Um. Acts 13 says this, verse 1, Acts 13, verse 1. In the church at Antioch, I want us to be like this church at Antioch. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers and Barnabas and Simeon called uh, Niger and Lucius of Cyrene, uh, Manian who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting... The Holy Spirit said, by the way, um, 
One of the ways the Holy Spirit says things is when we're worshiping the Lord and fasting. Like the intentionality of our worship speaks a lot to our ability to discern uh, what the Holy Spirit might say to us, how the Holy Spirit might choose to use us. The Holy Spirit said this, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. So here's a church in a cosmopolitan city with a rent, uh, trying to find space in a building uh, that doesn't have any upstairs and, and the, the associated problems. And so this is, this is the church at Antioch. And they go to pray one night and you've got a primary teacher in Paul and a primary kind of uh, deacon type leader in Barnabas, a servant an encouraging disciple maker. And um, the Holy Spirit says, I want those two guys. I want those two guys. I want those two guys and, and I want you to send them off to the work I've got called for them, which, which literally ends up being missions work, which literally takes the gospel to the rest of the world through Paul and Barnabas. Fascinating story, right? That's a big work. It's Christ-centered work. What does it do for this little congregation uh, called Antioch? Nothing. Not, it doesn't do anything directly for them. It doesn't grow their church. It doesn't bring in more money. Uh, it doesn't increase um, the satisfaction rating of, of the congregants, whatever. It, it's that church being able to share in the work of the Holy Spirit by giving something away. And so when we started Antioch, we said this. I want you to say it with me in just a second here. But we want to take the best of what God gives us and give it away. We want to take the best of what God gives us, whether it's Paul and Barnabas, whether it's anything else. We want to take the best of what God gives us and be willing to give it away. So I want you to say that. The best of what God gives us and give it away. Say it with me. The best of what God gives us and give it away. I've seen churches before where, where they start talking about doing a church plant and the people are like, nope, don't want it. Why? Yeah, because um, those are my friends that are going to leave. And I, we'd rather use that money for something else. So when we started Antioch, we put church planters up here. If you remember, if you were with us in the early days and we said, um, if God's calling you to go with this person, go. And people went. And I was like, dang it. That was a bluff. <laughs> we weren't supposed to do that, right? But it, it disciplined us to be willing to say, uh, we're going to open up our hands. There are things like Kilns College that God is blessing and other things where the elders at Antioch said, we don't know if this makes good business sense. Um, but God seems to be calling us to do this. Um, we have our Antioch offices. I have a friend who has a, a church and they're now meeting uh, in the Antioch offices on Sunday mornings, right? I love that. You want to know why? Because we're not using the Antioch offices on Sunday morning. Like, to me, that's kind of cool, right? And so the question like rent or not or um, wear and tear or not, right? You want to know what the answer to that one is? No. Take, take it for free. Why? Because that, that whatever couple hundred bucks, um, at the end of the day, I'd rather that church give that to their pastors than to give it to Antioch. We don't need it. Right? And so we want to take the best of what God gives us and give it away and go, you know what? There's a different economy at, at play here in the kingdom. In the kingdom, it's about serving and it's about giving and it's about glorifying and it's about his work. And how do we join that? And how do we be a part of that? And so if I were to draw it, it'd, it'd be simply this. Brothers and sisters, there's God, there's the church, and there's the world. And when through Christ, we reflect back the image of God to God, what is that called? It's worship, and it's authentic spirituality. And when through Christ we reflect back to the church 
the image of God in us. It's community. It's Christ-centered spiritual community. When through Christ in us, we reflect to the church the image of God in us, it builds community. And when through Christ, we reflect the image of God to the world, it's missions. And so when we center everything we do on Christ and we get to join in this thing, this beautiful thing, and reflect back to God the glory of God, the image of God, we get to find ourselves caught up in worship and community and missions. And if we don't do that, one thing will always be true of us that will lack meaning and purpose and joy. And I have to believe, no matter what the the struggles or the trials or the difficulties you're facing, that if through Christ we get to join in that and worship God, live in community, and be on mission in this world, we will always have meaning and purpose and joy despite our trials. That's the calling we have. That's that's the calling we get to participate in. I'm excited about this. I, I wake up excited about this. I... I love church and sometimes I feel like I have to stop loving church as much because it's not as cool as it used to be. And I, You know when you like something like underoos when it's no longer cool and you become the odd man out? And so sometimes I'm like, I, I, I'm a follower sometimes. Sometimes I'm like, maybe I should like church a little less so that I can actually like be in that conversation over there or meld with all those people that are down on church. And then I'm just like, um, but I really like church. I like the idea of church. I like the calling of church. I like our church. I like that we get to own church and that we get to be a part of the solution of bringing about something that hopefully will be light in a dark place. Let's pray. Father, always point us to truth. Always point us back to your son, And always fill us with your spirit that we might have joy, that we might have meaning, that we might have purpose. Help this group of Americans break whatever barriers we need to break so that we can intentionalize community with one another. Put your stamp on our schedules. Put your stamp on our priorities. Put your stamp on our hearts. Somehow, someway, Father, meld us together as one. In Jesus' name.